Hi there. Benvenuti nella mia cucina. Welcome to my kitchen. My name is Paul, though in Italy my father was from Naples. His father had olive groves there. And in Italian, my name would be Paolo Mauli. Very rhythmic, don't you think? <laughs> in American, it's Paul Mealy. And I'm Paul, and I like to cook, and I want to show you some things today mainly something called gnocchi. Now, funny story, when I worked uh, at the post office years ago, I uh, worked with a nice older lady, and one time we were talking about cooking, and I tried to tell her about gnocchi. And she looked at me with this grumpy face and said, what the hell is yucky? And I had to explain it to her, but at that time it made me laugh. It was kind of funny. And it's not pronounced yucky. It's gnocchi, and it's a pasta, an Italian pasta. Uh, many people have had it. You might know, have bought it dried in the grocery store or even had it at a restaurant. But most of the time, the recipes you see are kind of small pieces and a little bit dense. Some are made with potatoes. Some are made with just ricotta. But um, they're different, and I have another different one passed on to me from my grandmother on the Sicilian side. And I would like to share it with you because if you don't really care for gnocchi because you feel they're too dense, too heavy, that they sit in your stomach, these are pillowy, they're light, they're shaped different than the ones you're accustomed to, and they're really quite good. So I would like you to try it, and I'm going to show you how to make it from scratch, including the ricotta cheese from which these are made. I don't make the potato ones. They are too heavy for me. Um, so these are ricotta ones, and we'll start by making our own ricotta, and it's really easy. You're going to be surprised. So let's get started, and what I'm going to do is get a glass heat-proof bowl, which I have right here. And I'll put it here for a moment. You can see that. Yeah. I have no cameraman, and I have to do this all myself, so I may be moving around, moving the camera, whatever, but I'm doing the best I can to show you. I have uh, half a gallon of whole milk. We're making cheese, so we want the fat in there. You could use reduced fat, but you won't get exactly the same results pour the milk into the big bowl and to that because we're making a pasta and I want the ricotta to be a little bit dense I have a small container of heavy cream and how many ounces? 8 ounces of heavy cream not the big container, the small one I'm going to add that too Okay, so I'm going to take this and put it up here in the microwave. Oh, a heavy for me. And I'm going to set the timer on full power 18 minutes, but when it reaches about 15, you have to keep glancing over. Once it starts to bubble up, you want to stop the microwave. You don't want it to boil all over the microwave. So let me... Start with my 18 minutes, and while that's going, I am going to, I've got a little juicer here. And to make ricotta, we need an acid to react with the milk to separate the curds and whey. So I was going to take these out before, and I didn't. I've got lemons. I forget to take something out. Lemons. And come over here. I'm just taking them out of the bag. I know you can't see it. I'm going to take out three lemons, wash them off before I use them. Even though we're not using the rind, there could be dirt, bacteria, whatever, and when you're juicing them, you're still touching the outside of the lemon, so you could get contamination. 
and I have a very sensitive digestive system. I have problems, so I have to be careful with everything I do to make sure that there's no bacteria. So I wash off my lemons. I'm just going to juice the three lemons. Should be enough. I'll see. Might be too much. Just juice those right away. have one of these little tiny juice things. You can buy a little wooden one which you can juice with. Or you might have a big juicer. I have a big electric one too, but I don't feel like cleaning. <laughs> Not just for a few. If I was going to squeeze like a whole bag of oranges, I'd take the electric one. So just three lemons. not using any rind or anything. If uh, I was going to be making a ricotta dessert with this cheese rather than a pasta, then I would probably use my microplane and save the lemon rind, but I'm not. Okay, I need my measuring Pyrex, which I've got here, and a strainer. You don't want pulp just want the lemon juice, so I've got a little sieve, strainer. Take the cover off of this and pour my lemon juice in. And check the quantity. I don't want it to go over a third cup. Actually, I could pour it back down. Just pour it. Add a spoon. Stir. And stay out of the way so you can see. Okay. And just a little below a third of a cup, which is fine because we're going to add something else. Because to that, we're also going to add. Now, a lot of, if you look up ricotta recipes to make it at home, they'll usually have either lemon juice or white vinegar. I use both. Mostly lemon, but then also two tablespoons of white vinegar. Now if I was making something really more for a dessert, a cake or whatever, I might use just the lemon juice, but you get more curds by mixing the two acids. At least I find that anyway. And this comes to just a little bit above a third of a cup, which is exactly what I want. So that's done. Put this in the sink. And I won't keep using that anymore. Washed. Is that the way? Okay, we don't need lemons anymore. I'll just put them out. Side. And we still have 13 minutes to go on the milk that's in the microwave, and it's fine. So now we got to prepare to strain that. Curds away. So I'm going to get a glass bowl. I've got a metal sieve. You may have a different one, but you want one that has kind of fine mesh. You don't want the mesh to be too big. I have some sieves with a wider mesh. You don't want that. You can't just do it through here unless you want to lose a bunch of the curds, which you don't want. You need cheesecloth. I buy my cheesecloth from Amazon. Amazon has really good cheesecloth, fine mesh for cooking. And, uh, you can just 
search for it on Amazon. Now this is the standard white one that you get in the grocery store. And if, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but it's got very wide mesh. And if you strain your curds and whey through this, you're still, gonna, still going to lose quite a bit of the uh, curds. And we want as much as possible. If you do have to get this, if you have no way of getting the other cheesecloth from Amazon, you're going to want to, this is double, you're going to want it four. And you're going to get, I need to get a big piece because it's got to line this entire sieve. So I have my big hunk here from Amazon. And I'm just going to, let me bring this back here so you can see. I'm just going to unroll this, make it long enough so it drapes over the side. And I'll grab my scissor. And just cut. Kind of hard to cut this cheesecloth. Okay. Let the cheesecloth. And then what you want to do is open it up. to drop it on the floor, which I do. Sometimes, if you, I don't know if you can see this, but the, the mesh is finer than that white one. Okay. It's open, and it doesn't have to be perfect. You want to fold it in half so it's doubled, like that, and then line Press it in all the way down to the bottom of the sieve. And that's just going to sit here waiting for the milk. Okay. See, this is, I see it says unbleached cheesecloth, 100% cotton, very fine mesh, 28 by 24 weave, lint free, grade 50. So if you can get that, that's basically what you want. And I keep a lot of it in the house because I make my own ricotta all the time. It's cheaper. If you go to the grocery store, even on sale, the big container, which is what we'll get out of this, of ricotta is usually like at least $5 in my grocery store. Sometimes it'll be on sale for $3.99, but very rarely. The larger one, they have the small and the larger size in the grocery store. If you don't want to make your own, if you can't, if you're going to use the grocery store one, you still need to strain it. You don't need the cheesecloth, but at least put it in a sieve and let it drip for a while before you use it because the, the one from the grocery store is really moist and that's not good for the pasta. You'd have to add a lot of extra flour and that'll make it too gummy, so you don't want that. So I would not use the uh, ricotta from the grocery store if you can help it. It's so easy to make, it really is worth it tastes so much better. You'd be shocked at the difference. And you can use it, make it right away, use it for baking, if you want to make cheesecakes, ricotta pastries, I use it for all those things. But for now we're just going to be doing pasta. So um, We could start on, I'm going to be making tomato sauce and uh, some meatballs. Rather than do that, let's do one thing at a time. So now I'm going to pause the camera and wait until the milk is ready, or until it's ready to add the next step, and then we'll start again. Okay, it's 17 minutes, and my milk is already bubbling. So I'm going to stop the microwave. And what you want to do, you leave the big bowl in the microwave. Can you see it? Take your lemon vinegar mixture, pour it into the big bowl, no stirring, don't touch it. Close the microwave, two minutes on high. Just let it go. So since that's a so short time, I'll stay with you for now. That. I've got the cheesecloth in the sieve there that we did before, and we can start as soon as the ricotta is draining, uh, we have to leave it to cool down before we make the pasta and we'll start 
on the meat mixture for the meatballs and then we'll start the tomato sauce. So what we're going to do, we've got some fresh parsley which needs to be washed and I'll show you how I prepare my parsley both to use some in the sauce and in the meatballs as well because I don't like a lot of stems when uh, I use parsley so I'm kind of fussy. It takes more time but it works out better for me in the end and I'll show you how to do that. I'll put that here for now. And we've got one minute left on our mix and actually that's still going to sit in the microwave for a while so I think what I'll do it's going to rest for a little bit after we're done. Now I'm watching, you still keep glancing in there. If it starts to boil up a lot, you're going to stop it. 39 seconds. I think it'll make it. We'll see. Now actually it's really bubbling now. So I'm going to stop. I have 30 seconds left. I'm going to stop it. Just leave it in there maybe five to ten minutes. Let it just sit. It's really hot anyway, so let it sit there. So what I can do is start with the meat. So let me readjust the camera here. I'll move it over. I'll try to be slow so you don't get too dizzy. And point it down. So you can see my bowl here. And actually I forgot I told you I was going to do the parsley first. Okay. I'm just going to get, I'm using this Pyrex for now because I don't have another bowl handy. And I'm going to get a sieve, a different sieve. And I'm going to take out my parsley. I know you can't see me, but who cares? You're supposed to be watching the cooking, nothing. I'm just going to take some out here, stems and all. Stick it in the sieve. A little more. There. This aside. And then I want to rinse this off. I can break some of these stems off. I'm not going to use them. Pull them out. And I'm going to rinse the parsley with the spray from the stem. And the big stem. So, even if you buy organic parsley, I'm never positive that uh, all there's no insecticide on there, any chemicals, or maybe when I was out in the field, there have been times when I bought parsley from the fields that we have. I'm here in California, and we used to have these nice strawberry fields. And adjacent to them, they would grow herbs a lot of times, and they would have fantastic stuff. But they were open, and a lot of times animals, dogs, cats, whatever, would go in and pee. Um, and you could smell it <laughs> when you bought the, the herbs and brought them home. And so they had to be washed really, really well. Okay, here's our parsley rinsed. Now, what you're going to do, they get a paper plate. You're going to take a stem at a time and you're just going to pick, you just want the leaves. A little bit of stem in between the leaves is okay, but not this big stem thing. You don't want this. Okay? So we're just going to go through and pull off leaves. They stick to your hands, just pull them off. Yes, it takes time, but it's worth it. You won't have all those big stems your final product. So you can break a bunch off like that. The tiny stems right by the leaf are not a big deal. It's these big, long, thick stems that we want to avoid. Plus, at the same time, I'm looking at the leaves to make sure if they look wilted, if they look black, brown, whatever, don't use them. I want the nice green ones. You know, if they're wilted, then something was wrong. You don't want to eat that. You want to, whoops, it was wrong before. And move this over. Um, you don't want to eat something that's starting to go bad. 
at least I don't. As I mentioned, I have a lot of internal plumbing problems, so I have to be very careful with everything that I eat. And yes, I washed my hands. Well, I was off camera. I actually washed some of the dishes. See, this leaf is on the And I washed my hands. Don't worry, they're clean. I keep a big thing of Purell over here so I can keep rinsing my hands so I don't get bacteria. Again, I have problems and if I get where most people, if they get some bacteria in them, really doesn't do anything. It doesn't bother them. It just goes through their system. But not me. If I get any of that, I suffer big time. So I have to be more careful than most people are. And I never use anything that falls on the countertop. Even though I clean the countertops and rinse them off and I have this uh, another Purell surface cleaner that I use. And I still don't trust things falling on the countertop. Again, that's just for me. If you don't have problems, don't worry about it. You see, it's not taking that long. Besides, the ricotta cheese has to sit in the microwave right now. What it's doing right now is it's separating into curds and whey. Whey is the liquid, curd is the cheese. And you know the old fairy tale of Little Miss Muffet. Well, now you're making curds and whey. Some people use the whey to, like when they boil pasta, they'll add it to the water. There's a stem like that. Um, some move, use it in uh, smoothies or stuff like that. Personally, I don't. I don't want it. So I throw the whey out. I don't keep it. If you're a health nut, you're one of those people that wastes absolutely nothing, go ahead and use it. And probably look up things to do with whey. I know they sell these containers of whey protein in the health stores. It's a dry powder. I guess they evaporate it down to powder. Like that one. Okay, and these don't look so great either. So here we are. Here's my plate of parsley with most of the stems removed, at least the big ones, just some tiny stems. So the parsley is ready, so I'll set it aside for now. And at least we got that done. I'll clean this up. Get this out of the way. And now we're going to take, and I'm going to stay over here. You can't, I know you can't see me. I'll bend down for a minute. I'm going to stay over here so you can watch what I do with the uh, ricotta cheese. I'll move it over so it's closer to you. Here's the cheesecloth in the bowl. And I'm going to take the other out of the microwave. I know you can't see, but I'm just lifting it out and bringing it over. I'm not doing anything different. I'm going to take it out of the microwave. Try not to jostle it too much. We don't want it. Want the curds to break up. It's heavy, so be careful. Okay. See that? See that on top? Cheese. <laughs> okay. Now, if you have one of these sieve ladles, see what it looks like? It's got holes in it. You're going to go down slowly into the curds and whey and lift. Lift out the curds. Dump them in the cheesecloth. And that's all we're doing is we're separating out curds, which is the cheese from the whey, which is the liquid. 
Some of the curves will be very tiny pieces, some will be bigger pieces. Um, and that's the reason for the fine cheesecloth, because if you use the wide cheesecloth or you just used the sieve by itself, all the finer pieces of the curds would go right through the sieve, down into the lower bowl, and unless you want to do it all over again, you would lose them, and that's kind of a waste. So you don't get every single little bit that's impossible because some of it's really, really fine. But I'm trying not to jostle it too, too much, although now it's pretty much down, but I'm not going really, really, really fast. Still, now the really smaller pieces are what's left. Before I go any further, I want to check my bowl. This is hot, so you got to be careful. And you can see the liquid in here. See it? That's the way. I'm throwing it down the sink. Because if it gets too full in there, it's going to go back up into the cheesecloth and back up into the curds. And we don't want that. A little bit closer, so I'm not spilling all over the place. This is all there is to making ricotta cheese. Now, is that hard? No. And the difference in the flavor. Now you notice I did not put salt. When it's done, when you're using whatever recipe you're using it in, or even if you're going to eat it the way it is, make a ricotta sandwich or whatever, then add the salt and add it to taste. Don't add the salt before you make it. It will affect the way the curds form. So keep the salt out. Now, a lot of uh, chefs that you'll see will, now when it gets down with these just these little tiny pieces, they'll pour this whole thing through there, but that wets all those curds all over again. And I don't want to set up a second bowl with more cheesecloth just to drain this through, so so long as I've got enough for my recipe, the little, little tiny bits that remain that even go through these holes in the ladle, I don't really care. If you want to take the time to go through this and get every single little bit of the curds out, then go ahead. But I'm not going to do that. You're saving money anyway. Like I said in the store, the large container of ricotta is on really good sale, $3.99. Most times I see it for $5.99, $6.99. I don't know about your store. Now if you have an Italian grocery store near you, you can probably get the ricotta from the showcase that they make themselves. And that, of course, would be a lot better. You'd want to buy at least a pound, well, I would say two pounds. So you have plenty. Okay, I'm happy with what I've got. I'm not going to bother with this anymore. So the rest of this will go down the sink when it cools. Don't throw it down the garbage disposal when it's boiling hot unless you want to mess up your garbage disposal. So I'll set this aside for a minute. And you can see there's the ricotta cheese in the sieve and the cheesecloth. Again, see the way? And you'll notice there's no pieces of curds in there. Now that little bit I can throw in the disposal. It's not going to hurt. Now what you want to do, this is going to keep draining. You want to fold the cheesecloth over the curds, press down lightly, pat it, and then just set it aside. That's got to sit there and drain for a while. And while that's draining, we can do other stuff. But I'm going to pause the camera, realign it again, so we can get started with our next step. I have to keep my eye on this camera. I only have 31 minutes left. Thank goodness the screen faces me so I can see that. 
and I have to change this. This is a DVD camera. Okay, I don't want to run out of time right in the middle. So now we're going to prepare our meat for the meatball. So I've got a package of ground beef. Actually, I have ground sirloin. And I like it really lean, and sirloin from my store seems to be much leaner. Which way am I going here? <laughs> I'll figure it out. I get backwards here. Okay, so ground sirloin. And this is my knife I only use for meat. I keep separate knives. And I see a little piece of grizzle or something in there I don't like. So I'm going to dump the meat in this bowl. You know, when they grind the stuff in the stores, they don't care what they throw in there sometimes. You have to pick stuff out sometimes. Now I have gloves. Fine. There they are. It's handling meat is kind of messy. I've got these plastic gloves that I bought these specifically for food handling. Get the meat all over my hands. And what I want to do is break up that meat. Put this knife over here. Now you can't, can you see here? Yeah, I think you can. I want to break up the meat with my hands. The gloves. Pick it up a little bit. And that's one big chunk. And we're going to do this some more once we add. If you see anything in there you don't like, well, sometimes they get pieces of bone in there. I don't want any of that. If you see any grizzle or bone, just pull it out. Okay. So it's pretty much broken up. These are off for now because we're going to work with other things. Okay, so we've got our beef there and we want to put in some parsley. Here's that parsley again. See it? Okay, what if I go over here? Yeah, you can see. So I'm going to take some of the parsley, most of it actually, a handful like this. And what I'm going to do is squeeze it between my hands. Okay, make like a little ball. And then get my knife. And I've got a cutting board over here. And I'm just going to cut parsley into smallish pieces. If you want to take the time to mince it really fine, or you have one of those tools that minces herbs, you can go ahead and use that. I don't care if the pieces are kind of big. I like parsley. I just don't want whole leaves. I want pieces of leaves. So I don't really feel it needs to be that finely mixed. But if you want to, go ahead. Don't put it in the food processor. That's too fine. So actually, that's good enough. I like to cook more simply, easily. Still tastes really good. So. Okay, here's the parsley. I'm going to dump that in with the meat. Actually, I think a little bit more because the rest of it is going to go in the tomato sauce. So I'm going to take another little handful. Curl it up. How do you judge? Well, look at the meat, look at the parsley, and think of red and green like Christmas. Let's see if you have just the right amount of each. Just go by look. Okay, there's the meat with the parsley there. Not going to mix it yet. 
put this other parsley away. I don't need it right now. And the next thing I want to do is add my cup to my bowls. I've got an egg here. Forks. I'm going to beat up the egg a little bit. Now you remember, of course, that beef comes from a cow. Dump the egg in. I, some people put two eggs in their meat. This is one pound of ground beef. Um, I really don't like the taste of egg that much. So I use one. If you love eggs, you can use two, but then you're going to have to add more bread anyway to make up for it. So that's up to you for me. So remember, I said beef comes from cows. So I'm adding milk. Milk comes from cows, too. So the combination is not that weird. One tablespoon, that's all. One tablespoon of milk. This is low fat. doesn't matter for this. And the other thing we need is garlic. All Italians love garlic. So I've got the garlic here, and I'm going to move the camera again. I'm going to pause, because I need to show you what to do with garlic. So let me pause this and realign. OK. I've got the camera pointing down at the work surface. So let me flip this around so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. So I know you can see, if I can see. And I've got a whole head of garlic. I'm going to break it into cloves. What I want are oops, one, two, three, four. See why so many in a minute. You get all this membrane, well not membrane, skin from the garlic. I'm going to dump that in the trash. Put these back on here. Now what I'm going to do, again I have a knife that I use just for garlic. I'm going to take the cloves. I'm going to cut the tip off on one side, the end off on the other side, and then I'm just going to use the knife to get that skin off. So I have clean clove. And you want to look for bad spots. There's a little brown spot there. If you see those, cut them off. You don't want to eat that. Just cut the two ends, the tip and the end off. Just use the knife to get the skin off. There's your clove. Cut, cut, cut. And I want to clean as much of this off as possible. Now some people put, we're going to use a garlic press. Some people put the garlic in the press with the skin. But then it makes it harder to clean the press out. And we're going to be doing more than one pressing. So I want to make it a little easier to clean each time. Make sure you get as much of that. If you don't get every little tiny bit off, that's OK. And any brown spots, just cut them off. I used to grow garlic when I had a house. I had a wonderful garden. I used to read up on stuff. And garlic underground can sometimes get, I don't know if it's diseases, but bacteria can get in there or other things. And I read that any time there's a spot on the garlic, you don't want to eat that area. There could be a bacteria in there or something. And again, like I said, my system is 
very sensitive, so anything like that at all. If you don't, well, your system may be okay, no problem. Okay. Now, here's the garlic press. All right. And you're going to see why I use that in a second. I'm going to get another little foam bowl here. And I'm going to put this through the garlic press. And you can see, I hope, a little pieces of garlic. And this is the important part. Move this aside. When I open this, do you see all of that membrane? Now I'm going to scrape it off. Watch. Now, when you're scraping this out of here, just think of that inside your intestinal tract. That's just one clove. We're going to do all of these. I'm going to do two at a time this time. Just squeeze it, scrape off the good garlic. Make sure you get it all. And then look at that. Look at that membrane. Now, of course, if that's in your intestinal tract, your body cannot process that. You don't have the ability to digest this stuff. So what's going to happen? It's going to go through, it's going to sit in there, your intestinal bacteria is going to try to break it down the best it can, but it can't. And what are you going to get? Gas. And if you have a problem like me, you're also going to get pain. Not just from the gas, but your intestinal tract too. So I always put my garlic through the garlic press. A lot of recipes, they just slice the garlic, bang it down with a knife, and throw it in. And when I was young, I could eat anything. I didn't have any problems, and I would do that. And it didn't really bother me. It would pass through. And probably I did get gas, and I just didn't think about it. <laughs> but now, no way. And it will help. If you're someone who doesn't eat garlic because of that, because it gives you a lot of gas, this will cut that down a lot. Now, depending on your system, you might still get some gas with the garlic, but nowhere near what you're going to get if this goes inside your intestinal tract. There's nothing your body can do with that except pass it out, and while it's still in there, and your body's working on it, well, <laughs> not so good. Okay, we're going to be doing more garlic for the sauce, and I'm not going to put that away yet. So here's my minced garlic. I'm going to throw that in with the meat. So now I'm going to realign the camera once more. Okay, here we are. That was quick. I'm going to throw the garlic in. Another plastic fork here. Get the garlic in the meat. Okay. I'm going to save that because we're going to use it again. So we've got our garlic, our parsley, and we need some herbs. Here's my teaspoon. So now a lot of people like oregano. You can put oregano. I can flip this. You can put oregano in there. I like marjoram. So I have some marjoram in a jar. And I'm just gonna put not a whole lot. Teaspoon of margarine. And I have this really neat spice, if I can find it. There it is. It's called Italian Sausage Seasoning. And it's a seasoning that has the spices that you'd normally find in a sausage. I'm going to put a teaspoon of that. It just gives the meatballs a little sausagey flavor, which is nice. I like it. If you don't like that, just put your... And that has oregano in it, so I'm not going to add more oregano. Okay, so we've got that. And one of the other important things that we need in here is cheese. So I'm going to move my cutting board out of the way here. And I need wax paper. Move my meat 
heat out of the way too for a minute. I use two sheets of wax paper, one on top of the other. I have my box grater. This is the box grater. I use this because it has very, very fine holes. It has even finer ones on the side, but that's too fine. Uh, you've got the shredding, but then you have these fine ones. Normal, the hand graters, I have one of those too. Um, it grates the cheese more in strips. This makes it like a powder, and it's better for something like the meatballs to mix in with the meat more efficiently. Now I've got a great big hunk of Pecorino Romano. Pecorino Romano is a cheese in, made in Italy from sheep's milk. It's pungent, but it's delicious. It's a wonderful cheese. If you don't like it, just use Parmesan. But I like to mix part of each. So I'm going to grate some of my Pecorino. You can see I have a big hump because I use a lot of pecorino. Be careful when you grate that you don't get your hands on that grater. This is a brand new piece, so it's kind of hard to start it. Once you get it started, it's not so bad. It's great, 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 great. I don't know if you, you can't, really can't see me. I'm just going up and down. Don't press hard. Let the grater do the work. If you press hard, the cheese may get stuck, may slip, and you'll cut your hand. So just grate it gently over those graters. The graters will do the work. Just move the cheese along like this as you go. Bang it on the grater to get off the excess. Okay, I'll set this aside for a second. And you can see what I've got. I would say that's about half a cup. You don't have to measure. Dump that in the meat. Meat's over there on the side for a second. I'll show it to you in a minute. And now, that's the Pecorino Romano. You can use just regular Romano too that they have in the grocery store. But the Pecorino has a great Italian taste. I think if you try it, you'll like it. Okay, so now I've got Parmesan. Everybody knows that. So I'm going to grate some Parmesan too. You want both. I don't think you have to see me grate. I think you know how to do that. If all you have is one of those hand held small little great things. Go ahead and use it if you don't have one of these box graters. Uh, you'll just get the shreds of cheese instead. salt and pepper too. So I've got my salt. I know cheese has salt, but we still need salt. A teaspoon of salt. Half a teaspoon of black pepper. If you like pepper, you like it hot, Put a whole teaspoon, but I think that's too much. Okay, so we got our, our eggs, our cheese, the meat, the parsley, the herbs, and we're ready now to mix again. So I'm going to grab and the garlic. I think I mentioned. 
Okay, more gloves. I just don't like getting that needle over my hand. And once we mix this, then it's going to go in the fridge for a while anyway. Okay, see it? I'm just going to mix with my hands. Wash your hands, because there's no way any utensils are going to mix this as evenly and as well as your hands. And as you're mixing this, you're going to smell the wonderful smell of the Parmesan, the pecorino, the garlic. It really is, and the parsley too, actually. It's a wonderful smell. I love pecorino romano. My favorite cheese. Okay, now of course you know that meatballs have breadcrumbs. So we have to add some breadcrumbs, but I'm only going to add some. Okay, now that's mixed. You don't need too many breadcrumbs in there. It's, you can feel it's pretty dry. We do it. So I've got some plain. We already add spices, so we're just going to use plain breadcrumbs. I guess I don't too much. Too much. And I'm adding a third of a cup of breadcrumbs. That's all. I measured that earlier, I wouldn't have to use more gloves, but I didn't, so here we go. I got plenty of these gloves, hundreds of them. It's just reaching, I have them in the back area, they're kind of hard to reach. Okay, gloves, and mix. If you don't have gloves, just use your hands, just make sure you wash your hands so you don't have any bacteria from the meat when you handle other things, especially when you're making the pasta. Your hands have to be clean. So just work those breadcrumbs into the meat. Go all the way down. If you use too many breadcrumbs, the meatballs will be hard. Really hard. breadcrumbs will absorb any moisture in there and then when you fry up the meat with that bread, pretty hard. And it's tender before. There's not that many ingredients, it's really not that hard to do with. I'll show you. There's our meat, you can see the bits of parsley in there. Everything's incorporated in there, so what I'm going to do, I've got food storage bags, whatever plastic bag you have is fine. And I'm just going to put that meat in here, only because I don't have room in the fridge for that big bowl. You could stick the whole bowl in there, but I'm going to put this in there. Stick it in the refrigerator for now, let it sit, so all those dried herbs fully reconstitute and everything keeps blending together. And then I'm going to pause the camera. I've got to change discs because I've only got five minutes left. And then we will continue with the next step. I'll clean up a little bit and we'll continue making the tomato sauce. Okay, I've changed discs in the camera and what I did is I took the cheesecloth with the cheese ricotta curds in it, put it in a little bowl. I'm putting that in the refrigerator along with the meat that we just put in. So they're both chilling while we go on and do the next step, which is we're going to make our tomato sauce. I've got a large pot. Not that we're going to fill it up, but at least it allows room for splashing. And you don't have to worry if you put too much tomato in it or whatever. There's plenty of space. So I could use a smaller pot, but I like using the big one. You don't have to worry about it. We're going to need an onion. Get here. 
I already pressed, well, I, yeah, right after I changed the disc, rather than doing this on screen, because you saw me already, I put four more cloves of garlic through the garlic press. So they're ready. And let me get my onion ready. And I have a knife I use specifically for onion. I keep my knife separated because sometimes the smell tends to linger on the knife. Plus, certain knives do better jobs on certain things. This one does a great job with onion, so I keep it for onion. So I got my onion skin off. I'm going to dump it in the trash. Okay. So there's the onion. Now, there's all different kinds of tomato sauce. Different sections of Italy, different people make it different ways. I follow my mother's way. I grew up with sauce without chunks. No chunks of tomatoes, no chunks of onions, no carrots, no potatoes. That's more a Naples thing. My Sicilian mother made tomato sauce smooth, and that's how I've learned to like it. So I am not going to cut up the onion. We're going to use it like this to flavor the sauce, but not to actually be in the sauce when we eat it. If you like onion, you can mince your onion or slice it, whatever you like, and put it in the sauce and you'll get lots of onion when you eat the sauce. Personally, I don't want that. Especially with this recipe with gnocchi, gnocchi are like little rafts and the sauce is going to go into the indentation in the raft and if there's big pieces of onion, it's kind of going to block that too. So It's up to you. If you like onion, go ahead and cut it up if you want and put it in. But I'm going to show you the way I was brought up and the way I make it, and you can decide what you want to do. Now, so we got our onion, I've got the garlic there. I still have that parsley from before. So what I'm going to do, and I'll do it right in this foam bowl, I don't feel like getting the cutting board out again. Remember, roll the parsley up in your hand. Roll it into a ball in your hand, squeeze it together, and slice. And watch your hand, don't cut your finger. I have gotten many, many a cut in the kitchen from knives, from graters. And I have that reminds me, I have to show you something with the grater, too. Okay, so there's our parsley, the onion, the garlic, the cheese grater. I left it out for a reason. How to clean the cheese grater. Okay, we grate it on this fine side and it's all full of cheese, right? You don't wash it in hot water right away. What will happen? The cheese will melt and get in those holes. You'll never get it out. Then when you rinse it again, if you try to rinse it in cold water, then it hardens. So what you do is cold water first. Turn on your cold water. Get a brush. I keep my brushes here. I have some for cleaning, some for food. This is my cleaning brush. Run it under the cold water and brush down into the sink. Not both ways, one way, until you get all the cheese out. Rinse the inside under cold water. You don't need the brush for that. If you do, go ahead and stick it in there. Make sure the whole grater is clear of cheese in cold water. Then turn on your hot water and wash it with soap and water. And when you wash these, you can't run anything over it because it will grate. So you pat the sponge onto the holes. This is my cleaning sponge here. Just pat it onto the holes. Inside, of course, you can rub. There's nothing in there. But to clean the, uh, all the different slots, you just pat them and then rinse it. And then you can rinse under hot water all you want because all the gooey cheese will be off. And that's how you clean your grater without going insane. I've done it the other way by mistake, and I paid for it heavy. It took me a long time to get that cheese out of it. So don't do it. <laughs> Trust me. Okay, here's a big pot. Uh, let me make sure you can see. Yes. Okay. Do not use olive oil. Olive oil tastes great, but it's no good for frying or sauteing because it has a very low smoke point. It'll start to smoke and burn, and your stuff will taste awful. So I have a Mediterranean blend. Canola oil, grapeseed oil, and a little bit of olive oil. That won't burn. 
So I'm going to put maybe three tablespoons on the bottom. I'm doing it by eye. I just want to cover the bottom of the pan. Put my oil away. I don't need it anymore. Turn on the gas. Put it on medium, not high. You don't want the oil to smoke and you don't want it to splatter all over the place. Just on medium. We're going to let it heat up. Meanwhile, over here I've got a can 28 ounces of tomato puree. Not whole tomatoes, not tomato sauce. I use Cento tomato puree and a can of Delalo tomato paste. You can use whatever brand you want, it doesn't really matter. I like this Italian. So we'll get that ready. We have our, I already opened the cans. I got a spoon in the paste to spoon it out. You want to have that ready because it's going to go in right away. Then we're going to need some water. So I've got a measuring cup got my measure. I'm going to put two cups of water in here. There's my water filter. Okay, so I've got my water. Just leave it here. And watch the oil. It should heat up pretty quick. I have over here some pack of bay, basil leaves and bay leaves, fresh bay leaves. The smell of bay leaf is wonderful when it's in a sauce. You don't eat that. Never try to eat that. <laughs> you won't be able to chew it. Um, but we want to put basil and bay leaves, so I'll go ahead and take them out. Get a foam bowl here. Actually, I think I'll go back to the oil. I think it should be ready. So I'm going to put my whole onion in the oil. You can hear it sizzling. And I'm going to get some wooden utensils so I can flip the onion around. We just want it a light brown on each side, which will go really fast. Now, the garlic, again, is through the press, so it's very fine. That'll burn so fast, you won't believe it. So once we add the garlic, we're going to add the tomato really fast. We're only going to let the garlic down a little bit. And this pops, so stand back. I'm going to lower the gas a little more. The onion, because it has liquid in it, when the liquid hits the oil, it tends to pop. You don't want to get burned, so stay back. It doesn't taste long. We just want to caramelize the two end sides of the onion. A little bit, just to give it some extra flavor. And it also flavors the oil. So just turn it. As soon as you see it's got brown on it, which it does, I don't usually do this, so I'm going to take it off so you can see. I think you can see. See the brown on the onion? Okay. So now I'm going to lower the gas again a little more. I'm going to add my garlic. Remember what I said, it's going to really fast the garlic goes. This is very fine garlic. The garlic's in there. The stir it. Smells wonderful. Enjoy the smell. And next thing is the paste. And that's it. Five seconds for the garlic. Throw in the paste. garlic browns that fast. It's only little tiny pieces that went through the garlic press. If you wait longer than that, it will start to burn. And you have to throw everything out. Don't ever try to eat garlic that's overbrowned or burned. It tastes disgusting. So that's the paste. And what you want to do is stir the paste into that oil. Just have the onion slide around in it too. Stir it in. Now I can turn the gas up a little bit from medium to medium high. Just try to break up the tomato paste in the oil. Let me do it this way so you can see. Just chop at it, stir it, just get it broken up a little bit. It's not going to completely dissolve, it's fine. And we're also heating it up a little. It's going to mix with the tomato puree anyway, so don't worry about it. I want it to heat up a bit and some of the oil to incorporate into the paste. Turn the gas up a 
little more because that paste is cold. Okay, when it's incorporated, the oil starts bubbling again. In goes the tomato puree, slowly. Stir up the puree. Just be gentle. Stir the paste and the puree together a little bit. of water, add your two cups of water. As you add it, stir. And right now it smells really nice. This will make a very smooth tomato sauce. No chunks, no lumps, no nothing. Very smooth, thick, nice tomato sauce for your pasta. It'll still have flavor. You won't have a lot of stuff in there. If you like all that stuff, you like chunks of carrots and potatoes, and you, know, you go ahead and make your sauce whatever way you like. But to me, this is the best one to go with this gnocchi dish. Because you want to taste more of the gnocchi flavor, not all tomato sauce flavor, and all those vegetables and all that stuff makes the sauce be full of flavor, and then it kind of mutes the poor gnocchi. <laughs> My poor gnocchi, I can't even taste you. Now monitor the sauce if it's still really th too thick. We want this to be a thicker sauce. We don't want this to be too thin. So to me it looks okay, but as it cooks, if it gets, starts to get really too thick, you can just add some more water. Just look at it. Judge it by eye. Okay, now the, the uh, parsley that we chopped up goes in there. Stir it in. And we're going to add some other seasonings. We've got to put salt, of course. I can't live without salt. I don't care what any doctor says, I want my salt. I got one and a half teaspoons of salt. And one of my cream. There we go. Quarter teaspoon of black pepper. No not too much. Some people don't like pepper. Turn that gas down a little bit. Stir that in. Smells good already. Too bad the camera doesn't have smell on it. Okay, we got our salt in there. Oh, and, and you're going to say, what? For this one. Trust me. One teaspoon. This is baker sugar. It's very fine. One. Come on. One teaspoon of sugar. If you don't have baker sugar, just use sugar. So this one is very fine. It dissolves better. You're going to say, sugar? Yes. <clears throat> I told you, remember, I have trouble with my insides. Sugar cuts the tomato acid a little bit. It's not going to taste like candy. There's plenty of sauce in there. One teaspoon of sugar is not going to sweeten a whole pot of sauce, so don't worry about it, but it will cut a little bit of that tomato bite. If you don't want it, you can't have sugar, you don't like it, whatever, just leave it out. But my original recipe has sugar. So it's only a teaspoon, it's not a big deal. It shouldn't hurt you. And I've already grated some more of my Pecorino Romano, and my this is the Parmesan. We're going to take one tablespoon of Parmesan. The rest of it we're going to use in our gnocchi. And one tablespoon of the grated 
Pecorino Romano, and stir that in also. Stir, stir, just let the onion rock around in there, roll around. It actually helps to stir the sauce, push the onion around to help stir. It looks really nice, very rich. Okay, so now we're going to turn on the back burner, put it low to simmer, move this to the back, turn that off. And we want this to simmer at least 15 minutes. Now again, a lot of people with other recipes, turn it up a little bit higher. For tomato sauce, will cook their sauce for an hour, um, hour and a half, two hours. I don't want that. When you overcook sauce, to me, it gets really acid, and um, I don't like the taste. And besides, don't you eat raw tomatoes in sandwiches? Do you cook the tomatoes for an hour? No. So there's nothing wrong with cooking the sauce a little bit. Now, if you're using fresh tomatoes, that's a whole different story. I could do another video on that. Those do have to boil for a very long time. Actually, they cook twice. You boil them once, you put them through a Foley mill, and then again they cook with the seasonings. So that's different. Then you are going to cook a long time. But for something like this with tomato puree and paste, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, that's all you need, and it's fine. Taste it, you'll see. You won't need to cook it longer than that. It's ridiculous to cook tomatoes that long. It's not necessary. You get all the flavor in 15 to 20 minutes. And why you, you don't want to spend all that time anyway, I'm sure, waiting for tomatoes. Okay, so I got my can I'm going to throw out. And we still have a couple of seasonings we've got to add. So let's get to that. Just rinse my hands, use some of the Purell. Okay, now we've got bay leaves. Here's the bay leaves. I get these from Sprouts. And we only need one because we're not making a huge thing of sauce. Remember, rinse, always rinse everything first. And you just throw the whole leaf in. Don't cut it, don't tear it. Just throw the whole leaf in the sauce. And then we've got some basil. Now, every time you buy basil, from the store, if you get it in these plastic containers, there's always bad leaves. So just pick out maybe one, two, three, four big leaves. A lot of these already are turning brown. And it's really unfair because they sell this stuff there. And it goes bad in the refrigerator really fast. And you don't want the brown parts on the leaves. If you want it, if the leaf is part brown, you could tear that part off. And I'm just putting it in my hands, and I'm going to rinse it in the sink, okay? I know you can't see because it's off camera, but I can't keep moving the camera. I'll make you do I'm just rinsing in the sink. I'm going to dry in a paper towel and just tear the leaves. Oops, I spilled. Tear the leaves in your hands. You don't have to cut them with a knife and throw them in. Okay. You don't want a lot. Just those three leaves. You want four leaves if they're really small. And this basil is pretty much not very good. A lot of bad spots in there. And stir. Stir, stir, stir. you got to stir a lot. Stir. Stir, 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 stir in the basil, stir in the bay leaf, stir in the spices. And you should, your kitchen right now should smell great. Okay. Make sure if it's boiling too hard, you lower the gas. You want this to simmer, not boil. It's just simmering. Okay. Done with that. Now. How much time I got left? 41 minutes. That's enough time. Okay, so we've got our sauce. Next thing is to get the meatballs ready. And 
you got to do the meatballs, and then finally, we're actually going to do the gnocchi. The reason I do the gnocchi last is right after we form them, we're going to boil them. So everything else has to be ready. The sauce has to be ready to eat, the meatballs have to be ready to eat, because as soon as you boil the gnocchi, you want to eat. So that's the last thing. They go pretty fast. They're not that hard to do. And um, actually, I should do the gnocchi dough first and put it in the fridge so it chills a little bit. So why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and make the gnocchi dough, and then we'll do the meatballs. This aside. OK. This is not hard at all. You're going to see how easy this is to make the gnocchi dough. So out comes our ricotta that's in the refrigerator in the cheesecloth. More liquid has come out. Just squeeze it a little bit. I don't know if you can see me. Just squeezing. Open your cheesecloth and there's a nice hunk of cheese. Dump it out and only a very little bit stays stuck on the cheesecloth. Most of it is right here in the bowl. See? Homemade ricotta, nothing like it. Pour out your cheesecloth. Don't reuse the cheesecloth. I know people say you can wash it. You can the, all the cheese doesn't all come out. I tried washing it. It doesn't it makes a mess. And especially if you put it in the washing machine, forget it. Okay, so here's the cheese in there. To that, I'm going to add the egg. See what I'm? Oh, you can't see. I'm going back and forth with the shell of the egg. See, like this. I'm dumping the yolk back and forth in the shell to get rid of the whites, which went down in a bowl I have in the sink. You should know how to do that. I don't think I have to show you. So one egg, one egg yolk. Heat them up. Keep going the wrong way on the camera, so I'm off. Yeah. Mix your eggs, throw them in the ricotta cheese. Might need more eggs, we'll see. It depends how this turns out. I've got a ceramic fork I like to use so you don't get any metal taste. Stir the eggs into the ricotta cheese. watching your sauce every time it starts really simmering up. Just give it a stir again. Okay. Just make sure it simmers, it doesn't boil. Stir, 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 stir. Okay, now we need some salt. Not too much because we're going to put cheese in there. I'm just going to put a half teaspoon of salt. And now I've got one, two, three tablespoons of pecorino. One, two, three tablespoons of Parmesan. Stir that in. No black pepper. These want to be just plain white pasta. I stir in the cheese. The 
only other ingredient now is flour, believe it or not. So here I've got flour. Okay, I'm making sure you can see. Get my measuring cup. And we have to do this by feel. So we're going to start with one cup of flour. Stir it in slowly so you don't splash flour all over the place. Yes, it looks really thick. It's okay. You want to incorporate all that flour. And I guess one cup may be enough. I'll find out in a minute. So I'm going to get the flour incorporated. We're not using a mixer, so you've got to stir it around yourself. I may need more. Once it actually starts getting absorbed into the ricotta, that's when you see if you need more flour. You see how sticky it is. And you know. This looks like it's still pretty sticky, but to find out, I'm going to clean my hands. Got my Purell. I'm going to touch it, pick it up. Still sticky. So now I'm going to go half, half a cup by eye. And mix that in. You know, a lot of, most times I've done this, if I use the ricotta from the grocery store, you'll usually use two cups, period. But with the homemade one, it varies, it depends how much it dripped, how dry it got. So you have to just add some at a time, just until it's just right. And you'll know by the feel of the dough, which I'll show you. Switch Mix that flour in. Get it off the sides. Let's see how this goes. Because you're going to be forming pasta with your hands, so it can't be super duper ultra gooey. We won't be able to. And this is still a little bit sticky, so I guess it's going to end up being too tough. Okay, there's my hands. So, it ended up about two cups. This should be enough. You know. Stir it in, stir it in. And now it's getting really firm, so it's kind of hard to stir it anymore with the utensils. What I'm going to do, this time you, I can't use my gloves because I have to feel the texture of the dough. So I'm going to wash my hands, get the flour out of the way so I don't spill it all over the floor. Move this over so you can see better, I think. Yeah. And now I'm going to work it with my hands. Let me put this fork out of the way. Just like you were making a bread dough or something. Don't knead it, just mix it together with your hand. We're not kneading it like bread. We just want to incorporate all the flour. That's all there is to this pasta. It's just ricotta cheese, egg, flour, and the salt. And of course, pecorino and parmesan. Very important. Now this feels pretty good. It will still be a little bit tacky, but when we work on it, we're going to add some more flour, and that will be fun. Just put all that flour off the sides of the bowl into the dough. It's a very soft dough. It's not like the pasta dough you put through the machine. 
to make ravioli or something. And that's what's going to make these so light and fluffy. You're going to be really surprised if you try these. Okay, here I am working the dough in my hand so you can see it. And you notice it's not sticking anymore. But it's still very soft. No more sticky. I can work it in my hands without it sticking to my hands. Doesn't have to be smooth. We're only making pasta out of it. Again, not not putting it in a machine or rolling it out or any of that stuff. You'll see. Okay, it's well mixed. That's good enough. Plastic wrap. Nice good piece of plastic wrap. Stay there. And this is going to go into the refrigerator to chill. It's going to make it a lot easier to handle too. Put this in the fridge while we do the meat. Simmering away, I'm going to stir. Okay. So before I do the meat, I'm going to clean up a little bit. And let me see my time. 29 minutes. I guess we have enough. So I'm going to pause. Okay, I'm back. I've got 28 minutes I see remaining on this disc. So we'll see what we can do before I have to change again. I'm going to take the ground beef mix out of the fridge that we did before. And I'm going to get a flat plate. What we're going to do, I'm going to move the camera, don't worry, because it's too far away over here. So let me, this time no gloves, you have to use your hands. Let me move the camera. Try to go slow. So you can see the dish. There we go. There's the meat. Okay, Purell. Make sure my hands are clean. Now we're going to do our meatballs. So, this is rustic Italian cooking, so I'm not going to use a ice cream scoop or any of that. I'm just going to do by feel, by eye. It doesn't matter if some are big, some are small. Who cares? See how I roll it in my palms? Palms, not fingers. See, it comes nice and round. Put some pressure, because you want the meat to congeal together. So put some pressure, and then just roll, roll, roll. They're a little different sizes, so what? They're pretty close. Oh, oh, they smell really good. I know people eat steak tartare, it's called, I believe, which is raw ground beef. Well, when you smell this, as you're rolling these, you'll feel like eating it. <laughs> Just from the smell, you're going to feel like eating these raw. They smell really good. If you used all the fresh ingredients, the fresh parsley, fresh grated cheese, that's what gives those wonderful aromas. If you use the box stuff, you know, they sell that cheese in a box for craft and other companies. And that stuff has really no taste. It's like, just like adding salt, basically. It really has no cheese taste at all. When you freshly grate pecorino and parmesan, wow. What a difference. And of course, I love pecorino so much, I can eat a piece of pecorino. You can't eat too much of that. It's salty. But, um, and it's very sharp, but still good. I like it.
And the real one is made from sheep's milk, though it's hard to find anymore. Most of the time, it's cow milk now. I was very disappointed because one of the companies my mother used to get was called Locatelli, Pecorino Romano. And when I went to check online, I found out that Locatelli, the traders, no longer use sheep's milk. They use cow milk. They're not really traders. Actually, sheep milk is very hard to come by. You don't get that much milk from the sheep. And, um, they use it for a lot of different things, so I can understand that it's hard to get that, so they can't keep making tons and tons of Pecorino Romano with sheep's milk because there just isn't enough. So they had to resort to cow's milk. It still tastes good, but there's no comparison to the sheep milk. That one really tastes good. Believe it or not, sheep's milk is easier to digest than cow's milk. I've made my own ricotta salata cheese, which maybe I'll show you when we're all done. Of course, you do that by starting by making the ricotta like we did today. And you have to let it mature. You have to put use a cheese press to press it into a hard form. And then it has to sit for at least two weeks. And it's really good. If you've never had ricotta salata, if you go to an Italian store, just get a small piece. Because you might not like it. It's very salty. But you only eat a little bit. You can grate that too. It's hard enough to grate. But I like it. My mom always loved that. Ricotta salata. Every time we went to an Italian grocery store, she had to have a piece of ricotta salata. I liked it too. She ate more of it than I did. <laughs> and you see our meatballs are forming. We're almost done, almost done. We still have to make our gnocchi, but first we're going to fry our meatballs. And that'll be all done. And then we'll put the pot, the water pot on. This is going to be a real tiny one. There we are. How do they look? Here's the meatballs. Pretty good? Yeah. I don't know, the coloring in my little monitor screen is horrible. I hope it doesn't come out. These look beautiful. They're really red and nice. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, now more Purell, because I've been handling meat. Stir the sauce, stir, stir. You can't see me, I'm just stirring. Okay, let me pause, move the camera, we're going to start frying. Okay, here I am, and I just put the big frying pan out here, make sure it's clean. Okay. And the stove, unfortunately, this big burner doesn't work very good, so I have to light it by hand. We want a little, let's say, medium high. I don't want them to cook too, too fast. I don't want the outside to burn. And in there, we're going to put the end of my mixed oil. So I have canola oil. I have to buy some more. The other oil. No olive oil. You want at least a half inch of oil. Let's do it by eye. Why no olive oil? Because it will burn. Trust me, it will burn. Before the meatballs are cooked, the olive oil will be burned. So here's our meatballs, okay? I'm going to put them over here next to the pan. And I've got um, another plate with paper towels. 
I want to drain the grease. So I'm going to set that over there. I'm going to drop some parsley on the floor so I'm going to pick that up from before. Okay, we need our oil to heat, so we got to wait a while. And stir a little more. Stir, 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 stir. And as soon as the meatballs are cooked, finally, we're going to actually make the pasta, the gnocchi. But at that time, we're going to put the pot on with the water to boil. I'll just leave this here. Um, and while the water is heating up, getting ready to boil, that's when we'll make the gnocchi. It'll take a little while, but it's not that bad. By the time the gnocchi are ready to boil, the water should be boiling, we can throw them in. 20 minutes later, they're done, and that's it. The meatballs will be cooked, the sauce is done. Just got to serve it up. It's not that bad. Uh, it's, it is kind of a, you need at least half a day, I would say to prepare all this between getting everything ready, mixing it together, forming the meatballs, cooking them, and all that stuff. So at least half a day. If you have a whole day, that's even better. You know, start preparing in the late morning and by night time it should be all done. Okay. I don't think this is hot enough yet. Still cold. All I did was touch a meatball lightly to the surface of the oil. It would sizzle if it was ready, but it's not. So it's going to take a little bit to heat up. So rather than keep you, and besides, I'm going to run out of room, so I'm going to pause till it's hot. Okay, I stuck a little meatball in there, and it's sizzling, so I know that the oil's hot. Put them in one at a time. Don't plop them in. Don't splash that oil on you because you'll get burned. Oil is a nasty burn. I've had it, believe me. If you do get burned with oil, get out some butter or margarine and rub it on the burn right away. And leave it on. Don't wash it off. Leave it on for quite a while. That should help. It's helped me. And then you can rinse it off with cold water later after it's on for a while. And it should help, if possible, not to form a blister. Okay, meatballs are in the oil. Just sure in. And I want a fork and a spoon. I'm going to time this two minutes. Meat looks really good, smells nice. Now also something my mother used to do, which I don't because oil bothers me now. Um, she would take some of the oil that's left in this pan after the meatballs fry because it's all that flavor from the meat. And you can do this. Just scoop out some with the spoon with the brown from the meat and put it in your sauce. But I can't because I can't digest that. It would bother me. So. If you think it's going to bother you, don't do it. Um, if you think it's not going to bother you, then just take some. Don't pour it all. There's a lot of oil in here. Whatever you do, you pour that all in your sauce, it's ruined. Just a little bit. Use a spoon. Scoop some out and put it in. Maybe three spoons or something. It would just give it a little bit of flavor. There's way too much oil to put all that oil in your sauce. Instead of tomato sauce, you'll have oil. <laughs> oil sauce. I and mean, it would taste awful. So you got to be patient. Just got to wait, 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 wait. I'm not the most patient person either, believe it or not. <laughs> you might say, well, all that stuff you've been doing, aren't you patient now? The interesting, when uh, my dad came to America, his father came over wanted to Americanize his name because the teachers in school had trouble pronouncing it. And that's where, when I, in the beginning, I told you my Italian name is Paolo Mauri. But uh, the way it's spelled, the American teachers just didn't know how to pronounce it. So they changed it to the Americanized Mili. But my real name is Mauri. I mean, my 
my dad's ancestral name. What's my legal name? Okay. Two minutes, so we're going to flip the meatballs over. One at a time. Flip, flip. Some of them will still be kind of light. That's okay, because we'll flip them again. Oops, I missed a couple. All right. Timer. important to stir the sauce every so often because it'll start separating a little bit of oils and everything that are in there. If you keep stirring it, you get a really smooth, nice sauce. Play with the meatballs a little bit, move them around, roll them a little. Didn't hurt. Now you'll see little cracks in some of the meatballs. The cheese that we put in here, the Pecorino Romano and the Parmigiano, of course, is melting in that meat. It can cause a little bit of cracking, but it has nothing to do with when you eat it, so don't worry about it. time I have left on camera. I don't want to run out. 11 minutes. Sorry it's sticking my face. <laughs> I can't see so good. It's hard to see. Okay. And start another two minutes. I'm checking them. They're not fully really done. What you want to do is try and turn them on the side. Whatever side is widest. One will be, as they're cooking, just turn them on their side, cook the side of the meatball. Some of them will stand, some won't. You'll see one side will look much whiter than the other. That's the side you want to stand on. I lean them up against each other to try and get them. You know, you can't really see, but I'm describing it. That should help. Now, the largest ones, I'm going to take a few, six meatballs, and throw them in the sauce. Now, most people like their meatballs, most people like meatballs, period, just fried like this. Um, I used to, my dad and I always liked the fried meatballs better than the one in the sauce. So I don't put them all in the sauce. Just put some, just to give some flavor. But the rest of them I leave just fried like this and serve them on the side. And they really taste good, just fried. 
One more. Monitor the meatballs. Some of them will be done already. Remember, they didn't go in all at exactly the same time. So roll them over. If they're golden on all sides, take them out, put them on the paper towel. Some will be, some will not be. The smaller ones will be ready. And you don't want them to all come out at the same time. Anyway. Just keep flipping them around. It doesn't hurt. See it's brown on all sides. Out. The ones that I threw in the tomato sauce weren't brown on all sides, but they're going to finish cooking in the sauce. They're going to steam them. The sauce boils. They don't have to be cooked all the way through. These do because you're going to eat them just like this. Unless you're really confident that your ground beef is absolutely safe, I would not eat raw beef. If you have a butcher, maybe, that grinds meat for you right there, you know the meat is. Safe. Pass off. Move this off the burner so the oil doesn't keep heating and smell the whole house up. And smoke. And there they are. How does that look? Fried meatballs. Yum. Mmm. Don't eat one right now. They're boiling hot. You burn your mouth out. I've done that. Okay. Finished with you, Tiger. So we set the meatballs side. All right, you put them over here. Once they cool down, if you're not eating right away, you can put them in the refrigerator. Um, you can always reheat them a little bit just before you serve them. Not in the microwave. Put them in the oven or reheat them in the frying pan. Um, or you could throw them in the, all in the sauce if you wanted to, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> But uh, they taste good cold, too, believe it or not. So it's up to you. You can refrigerate them, serve them cold, or just refrigerate them and warm them up just before you serve. Because we still have to make the gnocchi and we have to boil them. And I have to change the tape because all I have left on this is six minutes, and no way can I do the gnocchi in six minutes. So I'm going to pause again, change the disc, get prepared, and then we're going to make, finally, the gnocchi. Okay, I'm back, and I got a new disc in there. So I've got my large wooden board over here, and here I've got a big pot of water, which I'm now going to start heating. It's my lighter. This is the big burner because it's a lot of water. And it'll take the other burner forever. Now I want it on full blast. Okay, so it's just just water three-fourths full, no more than that because the pasta is going to fill it up. And I'm going to take a handful, actually too much, a handful of salt. I took a giant handful, just a normal amount, just to salt the water so that the pasta will get a little bit of salt in it. Get a little stir here. Stir the salt in. Otherwise it just settles at the bottom. Okay. And I'm going to put in just a little, little bit drizzle of olive oil. I hear many different opinions of this. Some say, oh, olive oil, you don't need to put it in the pasta water. The pasta doesn't have anything to do with the pasta sticking. Well, it, well, it gives it a nice flavor anyway. And in my experience, it does help for the pasta not to stick. So it's up to you. But to me, I use a little bit, not a lot, 
Okay, here is our gnocchi dough. And I'm over here in the corner. This is a very small kitchen. I apologize. I don't have much room to maneuver. It's hard to get the camera so you can see. Uh, the best I can do, if I had a professional kitchen, would be a lot different. A lot of these people who make videos have these really big, nice kitchens. I don't. This is all I got. Got to work with what I got. Okay, there's our dough. I'm going to take out a dish. Okay, flat dish. I'm going to stick it over here. And we need wax paper. Okay, I'm going to put wax paper on the dish wax paper handy, like so, see it? Now what you want to do, uh, let me go Purell my hands. Like I said, I have to be very careful. Now the dough is a little bit sticky, but not much. I need a knife. And it doesn't matter what size these pieces are because you're going to roll them out in just start with this side. Now. Flour on the board, not tons, okay, just some flour. What we're going to do is roll this into a rope. It's hard to fit all this stuff here. I'm doing my best. Roll, roll, roll. Can you see the size of that? It doesn't matter if it's perfectly even either. But there, there's your roll. And now use your knife and cut one inch pieces. About an inch, maybe a little more. Put them off your rope. Now you pick up one of your pieces roll it in your hand like the meatball till it's nice and smooth and then this is the different in Italy when they usually make gnocchi they either use the cavatelli board or they'll put their thumb in here and push and have it roll up like that see which is fine actually that's not so bad but they'll close it sort of like a shell but that's what mainly what you want to do is get that indentation in the middle so it looks like a little swimming pool or life raft or whatever. So roll, 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 roll. Get your thumb in there and push down. And it's going to start to get sticky because the dough is getting warm. You can even use your index finger to tap. What you mainly want is that indentation. Okay, and then put them on the wax paper. Keep flour nearby. I've got flour there so that you can dip your thumb in the flour before you stick it in there so it doesn't stick. Here. Just make that, you want a little, little raft with a dent in there. And this is what's different to me from other people's gnocchi recipes. I don't see them shaping them like this and it makes a difference. These come very light, very fluffy, but there's, when you put it in your mouth there's a, enough there that you really taste it. They're not chewy like they're gummy, but they're chewy in that you get enough pasta in there that you have to chew on it a little bit so you get the flavor. It doesn't just go right down. And you don't have to put a whole lot of them in your mouth, like those real tiny ones. And they're not heavy. They're really not heavy at all. Just tap your indentation. Don't let them touch on the wax paper. You don't want them to stick together. Oops, I need some flour. You can use your index finger too. Just like squeeze them together. Tap, tap, tap. Just make the little rafts. 
Actually, these are kind of small. I think next time I'll make a little bit bigger. I, I like them bigger. I don't like them too small. Maybe I'll go an inch and a half each. This recipe that I'm making, I didn't mention earlier. I would say feeds four max, three to four. If you want more, if you're having a lot of guests, you'll have to increase the quantities. I'm not going to give you increased measurements. You'll have to figure from what I've given you for the three or four, you can add more depending on how many people you're going to have. You could have another can of puree, another can of paste, four cups of water, like double the salt. You need a big pot. I'm going to cut another piece of the gnocchi dough. It's starting to get sticky because it's out of the refrigerator, so I'm going to put a little bit of flour. Not too much flour. You make it absorb a lot of flour now, then it'll get tough. Roll, 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 roll. I think you can see. I hope. Roll, roll, roll. I'm going to leave this roll a little bit thicker than the last time. Inch and a half, inch and a half. Yeah. You can make different, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, it doesn't matter. I like them bigger. I want to really taste my gnocchi. A little bit of flour. Wax paper. Roll. Roll, roll, roll. Helps if I turn this way so you can see what I'm doing. Tap it down. I'm just dipping my thumb in the flour so it doesn't stick when I make that indentation. And if you want to do it the other way, where you press your thumb and roll it along, you can do that too, like this. Just make sure you flour your thumb. It's going to get stuck in there. Just dip your thumb in the flour like that, real quick. Push your thumb in, push forward, just a little bit, and you get that nice hole in there. Now, if there is another video anywhere with where they make it the same way, I haven't seen it. I hope you'll try this way because it's really good. Go. There's the indentation. Roll, 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 roll. After this bunch, I just want to show you how I layer them. Then I'm going to shut the camera off until they're all done. No reason for you to watch me rolling every single one of them. It's all the same thing. Just do the same thing till you finish all the dough. Push down like that. Nice indentation. I'll show you the dish in a minute. So you can see what I've done. One more from that log. Dip in the flour. Put your thumb in there, use it together. Okay. What I want to show you is I've got this plate with them on it on the wax paper. Now what I'm going to do is get another sheet of wax paper, put it on top. Can you see? No, there you go. Put it on top of those gnocchi and the next layer is going to sit on that wax paper so they don't stick together. Okay, so the next bunch, I'll just start so you can see and then I'm going to shut the camera off. A little bit of flour, just a little because it's gooey. Not very gooey, just a little. Make a rope. Cut it into pieces.
Roll. Keep your thumb in the flower. Push it in there and make a raft. Put it on the top of the wax paper. Roll. And it goes fast. Dip your thumb in the flower. Once you get the hang of it, you go really fast. And this is only making for three or four, so there's not a ton of gnocchi. Put your thumb in there. It's like a little swimming pool. You know those little pools you have outside for the kids? And the sauce is going to sit in that indentation. And it's going to really, really Some are bigger, some are smaller, who cares? It doesn't matter. I don't cook for perfection, I cook for taste. I care about what it tastes like, I don't care what size it is. I do like to present it nicely, and I will do that, but as far as they have to be all identical and look all the same, and all, no, not necessary. I'm not going to get out a ruler and measure the length of each single piece that I cut off. Make sure they're all exactly the same size. Makes it more interesting this way. Okay. Didn't dip my finger. I'm getting stuck. You'll find if you don't dip your finger in the flour, your finger sticks and pulls the indentation right back out again. Dip, push, there we go. Okay, can you see that? Get out of the way. See the second row on there? I'm just going to continue. I still have that other bunch of dough until these are all ready. And then once the water is boiling, I'll come back and show you as I put them in. Okay, I'm back. You see the steam coming out of that pot? It's just about at a full rolling boil. You want to make sure it is a rolling boil, not just simmering. And here are finished gnocchi. Okay. There they are. I wound up with three layers with the wax paper. What we want to do is my Purell again. You want to put them in there a couple at a time, but you want to keep rolling along. You don't want to stop because we don't want them to have different cooking times, really. So I'm just going to take a couple, like so, and just gently drop them in. And go around in a circle so you're kind of not dropping them on top of each other. too close to that water, it's hot. Now sometimes the weight of those top layers will collapse some of these bottom ones, just re-tap the whole, the indentation, not the whole back into them again. It's no big deal. If you have a big enough tray, and I actually have a tray but I couldn't fit it over here, you can leave them just one big long layer on a sheet of wax paper. So they're not on top of each other like that. But for purposes of showing you, because I don't have room, I had no choice but to layer them.
the water is boiling much slower because it cools down as you put all of these gnocchi in there. Okay, once they're all in, I have a timer 20 minutes. I'm not stirring, not yet. Take this plate out of the way and what I want to do is get out bowl and a colander, which I'll show you in a second. Big bowl, colander, okay this is what we're going to drain the gnocchi into. And then to serve them, we're going to get the big bowl, which I'll get out of here. I don't have a lot of cabinet space either, so I have to move a lot of stuff every time I want something. I brought a lot of dishes from the house, but I don't have room for them. I got a big serving bowl. And that's ready. Now I see one of them is already floating to the top. Let me move the camera there so you can see. Flip this thing here. I'll try to move slowly. See they're starting to float? See that? They're coming up. Now other gnocchi recipes tell you as soon as they float they're done. Not these. These are thick and there's a lot of dough there. 20 minutes. Not when they float. Okay. So let me set this back down here. And I'll keep it on the pot. And once most of them are floating, I'll give a very gentle stir to the bottom. Make sure none of them are sticking. And you'll see, flip this around. move this closer. See they're all coming up now little by little. We can move it closer a little bit. Well, now I'll give it a little stir. Very gently. Gentle. Just move the spoon along the bottom gently. You don't want to bruise your gnocchi. And just gotta wait till our 20 minutes are up. The sauce is still here. Let me stir my sauce a little bit. I did turn the sauce off while I was making the gnocchi because actually it's done. And let me show you. I'll move the camera for a minute over to the sauce because you don't have to watch the gnocchi boil. Okay. And what I want to show you is I'm gonna scrape the sauce off. Here it is, the whole onion. You see it? And like I said, now if you love onions, you could cut it up now and eat it or put it in your dish. It's all cooked. Um, you could use it in another dish of some kind if you want. But I don't want it, so I'm just throwing it out. And the tomato sauce is done. With all that was in there with the water, you'll see there's not a whole lot left in there. It's just enough. And the other thing you want to take out is the bay leaf. You don't want anyone to eat that or get that in their mouth. So that comes out too. Okay. Alright. Now we'll go back to our gnocchi and we still got 15 minutes for the gnocchi to boil. No reason for you to just watch gnocchi boiling. So everything else is ready so I'm going to shut the camera off and as soon as the gnocchi are done I'll show them to you as I take them out and then the finished product. Okay? I'm popping back in for a second. I did want to mention that there's no need to stir the gnocchi again. 
once they're boiling like that, once you've released them from the bottom, you don't have to stir it anymore. Just leave them boiling for the 20 minutes, okay? I'll be back. Okay, there's three minutes left on the countdown clock. So, um, I'm going to start taking the gnocchi out. And let's see something there. And what you do is you put your slotted, I guess it's not a slotted spoon, but a slotted ladle in there. Shake, shake. Put them into and be gentle with these. They're very soft, which makes them very tender and very good. Just let the water drip off, shake a little bit, and gently into your colander, just a few at a time. Shake, shake, shake. You can feel how soft they are, just like pillows. And they're going to taste like that too. Shake, 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 shake. And you get most of the water off. By the time we're done taking them out like this, the full 20 minutes will be expired. See how nice they look? The dent is still there. They still look like little swimming pools. This is that same slotted, slotted ladle, I guess. I don't really know the exact term for this thing. It's the same one I used for the ricotta. This, and just go through the water. And make sure you got every one of them. You don't want to waste any. And that's it. Turn the gas off. Slide this back. Better use pot holders. cool down too. Now what I'm going to do is take my serving dish here, put some sauce in there, coat the bottom with sauce. Okay, I've got sauce in the dish like that. And then I want to gently some gnocchi in there. All right. And then we're going to put more sauce on top. Here's the sauce. I don't know if you can see. Sauce on top of the gnocchi too. Serve this, you put your meatballs around the outside. The ones that you put in the sauce. Space them out. And you have a little bit of sauce left over you can put in a little sauce bowl thing on the table. And now on top of this, a spoon. We've got, I've got my fresh grated cheese that we did before. I still have some left. And this I mix together, the pecorino and the parmesan. Just sprinkle some on the top. And that's it. Whew. There it is. 
gnocchi, Sicilian Maoli style. <laughs> it's actually half Sicilian, half Naples. The recipe is Sicilian, but my dad was from Naples. So there you go. I hope you try it. They're really good. Very tender. I'm not tasting this because it's way too hot and it'll burn my mouth out. So, But, but trust me, it tastes good. So I hope you try this recipe. Thanks for joining me today and uh, enjoy. And I hope your guests will enjoy too or you're just your family. Take care.